you see how this presentation is structured, right? So it's important to always to start from the time before the time we are looking at. So in this sense, we need to look what was there before the revolution. And there was the only diocese uh, outside of uh, Russia before the revolution. And this diocese was in America. Other than that, there were missions like mission in Japan, uh, mission in uh, roughly modern day Iraq in the territory of then Ottoman Empire. So uh, missions in China, which was very reputable one uh, starting from the 17th century. Then mission in Korea and the famous one, which uh, now is an autonomous church. Yes, it's an autonomous church. Yes, it's an, an autonomous church of the Moscow Patriarchate, the Church of Japan. Okay, so, so and other than that, there, there were parishes in Europe uh, that basically, uh, because uh, as, 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 as the Byzantine Empire, the Russian Empire was the Orthodox one around the words of the, the, of the sixth novella of Emperor Justinian uh, about uh, empire and church, about uh, uh, symbiosis, about symphony sort of. That's how it worked uh, in reality. You, you all uh, studied a lot, so no place right now to reflect on this, but uh, the, 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 the church was in charge of registering uh, births uh, and deaths and marrying uh, all, all people of Russian descent. If you are Russian, you, you expect it to be an Orthodox, no questions asked until 1905 when there was a manifesto of religious tolerance. So with this in mind, uh, if Russians would spend uh, half on a year or maybe permanently live abroad and there were places like Nice, in France, where Russians, uh, wealthy Russians would spend time or rotate. Some people would come, some other people uh, would arrive and so on. So, so churches were built there. And also if people of Russian imperial uh, house, royal house would marry into other uh, uh, royal families, it's also would expect that they would have their own church. That's why we have churches in Germany, that's why we have churches in France, which predate the Russian Revolution. Okay, so there were uh, embassy churches, like in London, in Berlin also. So there were several categories. All those churches, they were under dual uh, administration from the Russian Imperial uh, Foreign Ministry and from most holy governing Senate. Okay, so uh, when the revolution struck as a civil war, masses of Russian refugees found themselves outside of the country. They were traumatized, they were traumatized and kind of it was again along the lines what we've been talking like uh, already the sort of unit sort of uh, what uh, Brat Ivan Griznov uh, identified as cultural shock. Okay, sort of because those people like uh, I'm 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 picturing uh, priest Eugen Smirnov. He was an educated Russian priest. Uh, who for, the, for for years lived in London. Apparently he was by culture totally at home, right? Sort of upper stiff uh, leap, okay? Uh, uh, attitude, British attitude, kind of keep poker face and be very, how to say, helpful to people and so on. And suddenly all those people who were radicalized, who were traumatized by the Russian revolution start to appear. And he wrote somewhere, that uh, I don't understand them. And it's precisely what people of my type experience when they came after the collapse, even like shortly before the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? So that's interesting, okay, to identify similarities in, uh, in, in history. That's, I really love it. So 
uh, and those masses they became uh, the core uh, core contingent uh, of the Russian church abroad, core element of the Russian church abroad, masses of Russian political refugees. In 1922, the Soviet Union canceled their citizenship. They became stateless, and many of them didn't want in the first place the Soviet citizenship. But the, since the Soviet Union very strongly claimed uh, itself to be uh, a successor to the Russian Empire, right? So, kind of, uh, I, I I don't know for how long uh, old Russian passports were valid, but Fritz of Nansen, a very a very famous Norwegian explorer, uh, on uh, he was in charge of the refugee committee of the newly founded League of Nations. So he proposed a special type of identification of an identification document for the Armenians who also understandably were uh, stateless because of the uh, things that happened in 1915, uh, the Ottomans, uh, the way the Ottomans handled Armenians, right? Uh, so, and uh, uh, for the Armenians and the Russians, there was special identification document which became conventionally known as the Nansen Pass, as the Nansen Passport. And some of the people, they preserve this document until, uh, the, until the 1990s. So because they also were loyal to Russia, they didn't want any other foreign, uh, foreign citizenship because they consider themselves uh, uh, sub Russian subjects, or I mean subject, you need to have a crown, but it's so Russian citizens. And uh, they didn't want any foreign, foreign uh, to be foreign nationals. They suffered consequences. They could not travel freely, but they was they, they wanted to remain loyal to their country. So uh, it gives you idea about type of the people Russian Church abroad ministered, uh, and also uh, that it was very politicized uh, flag, very politicized flag. And, and uh, <clears throat> this flag needed its own uh, its own uh, uh, ministers, right? So, and that's why uh, no one else would efficiently look after them, I guess. Okay, so Metropolitan Anthony, he's really big, he's really big figure. So he uh, became uh, became the first hierarch of this church. It's somehow patterned. You see this rocker, Rovs, Rovs, it's Rossiyski, uh, Obshivoyensky, uh, Soyuz, uh, all uh, Russian military union, which united all uh, officers who came uh, over from Russia uh, abroad, that they would be uh, summoned to continue the struggle against Bolshevism whenever it would uh, happen. So basically, Russia Chuchi abroad sort of uh, follow this pattern and, and this all Russian military union had uh, members uh, around the globe and so uh, is the Russian church abroad. Okay, so 1922, because of the involvement in uh, politics uh, in 1921, the Frost Pan Diaspora Council, Patriarch Tikhon um, uh, disbanded the Supreme Church Authority abroad, okay, in 1922. Uh, what he was referring to was that in 1921 in Serbia, there were two resolutions. One resolution was about the restoration of the House of Romanovs, uh, and the other one uh, to the uh, work community, uh, not to support the Bolsheviks, right? But instead to give arms to the Russian anti communists. And Patriarch Tikhon uh, uh, was held accountable for those by the Soviet authorities. And uh, he, neither he or his close circle of advisors endorsed those documents. They were not happy because they were used against the church in Russia to by the Bolsheviks, actually. Right. So, so you kind of you see this political component was very strong. So now mines are centers of the Russian immigration. So this is uh, Rue de Rue, this group picture. The church was built during uh, the time of Alexander II and consecrated back then. Then at the upper corner, you see the Russian Holy Trinity Church uh, in Belgrade. 
okay uh, i'm not sure exactly it's probably rudaru i'm not sure what what uh george uh, uh, internal view is this but the next one is the resurrectional cathedral in berlin that was built with uh, support of the nazi government right uh, and now this belongs to the moscow patriarchate in berlin okay uh, and then the next one would be nice right and uh, at the very uh, left uh, upper corner is harbin which was essentially a, a city in china in manchuria built by russian russians as the capital for the railroad also built by russian uh, government uh, at the end of the 19th century so we are looking at two points in china you see this list uh, at the uh, right uh, lower corner two places in china harbin in shanghai so paris belgrade berlin those were major cities uh, of uh, of russian diaspora okay so berlin was of course devastated because the newly founded uh, the republic of versailles so called uh, i'm i'm sorry i'm sorry not in the pact of versailles uh, but uh, so the, the 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 newly founded German Republic, they had to uh, it had to pay huge reparations. Weimar Republic, that's the word of it. Weimar Republic, so it had to pay huge reparations. So it was quite impoverished. But I mean, Belgrade was uh, the capital of the country that actually gained the most out of the war because this uh, kingdom of the Serbs. Uh, uh, Croatians and Slovenes came out of this. So, like, uh, uh, huge parts of Austro-Hungary were passed over to Serbia under Serbian uh, rule. So, and this newly founded state needed fresh blood, and Rus Russian educated people they were very suitable for this uh, purpose. Okay, so they received uh, thousands of Russian refugees and also hosted uh administration of the russian church abroad that was located there from 1921 until 1944. okay so now you see it was kind of bumpy it was bumpy right because already in 1926 there was division like uh, and and those peoples like metropolitan evlogia metropolitan and metropolitan plateau they were big shots they were really top Russian hierarchs. That would be like we, we talk today about the, the the upper level of Russian bishops, so, and and they were like Metropolitan Platon. He was member of the Supreme Secret Council of the Russian Empire. So Metropolitan Evlogi, he was active in Russian Parliament before the revolution. They were top uh, top notch uh, uh, professional churchmen, right? So kind of the level of their expertise was quite quite extraordinary okay but now as they, they their opinion divided sort of russian church abroad take of the situation was that we represent council of russian bishop we, rep we represent assembly association of russian bishop in diaspora you cannot really uh, uh, oppose yourself to it okay so metropolitan evlogi he had his points that his opinion was not really heard about and and it was very much about sort of interfering in his vision and his vision was connected with sincere theological institute founded in paris in 1925 on one hand metropolitan anthony was very excited about the foundation of this institute on the other hand from the very beginning there were very strong conspirological attitudes like so there were money from masons or some people were connected with masons and there was also ymca involved so and uh, archbishop Feofan of poltava he became an opponent of metropolitan anthony uh, kind of uh, he was very very uh, uh, how to say, careful about uh, what was happening there. It sort of conventionally was considered as a liberal place and so on. So Metropolitan Evlogi didn't really like this kind of attitudes and also Patriarch Tikhon appointed him to be in charge of the Russian uh, ecclesiastical diaspora. He 
1922 declined this offer. Now he felt that he could use it. So it's kind of was, uh, was co confusing. So uh, sacraments, once Metropolitan Yevlogian Platon, there are photos at the, uh, in this row, uh, Evlogi is the very first one from the left and Platon is the next one. So they started to be directly under Moscow Patriarchate. They were suspended by bishops of the Russian church abroad. And then in 1927, Metropolitan Sergei came up with his declaration. And then uh, Bishop Veniamin, uh, uh, he uh, 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 proclaimed loyalty to Metropolitan Sergei so by 1930, we had in the Russian diaspora, the Council of the Russian Church Abroad, which uh, exists until today. <coughs> Metropolitan uh, Yevlogi joined the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1930. Metropolitan Platon uh, was autonomous. And then uh, uh, Archbishop Benjamin, he was uh, under Metropolitan Sergei. So by 1930, uh, one, we had uh, three uh, Russian ecclesiastical units in the diaspora. So Serbian Patriarch Varnava, he became uh, very helpful in uh, amending ecclesiastical peace. And reportedly Serbian King, King uh, Alexander, he uh, said that, uh, he said that uh, if Russians uh, would not uh, find way to reconcile the Serbian state would not really support them, not the Ser Serbian state uh, would not really uh, able to continue helping them. So 1935, luckily there were uh, suspensions were removed. There was uh, uh, pacification, reconciliation, the Russian diaspora. Metropolitan Yevlogi didn't really ratify this agreement. He remained uh, is, uh, under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. But in America, uh, actually, things work very productively. So uh, Metropolitan Platon was already dead, but his successor, Metropolitan Theophil, he uh, joined this uh, kind of uh, sort of fellowship of Russian churches in diaspora. And all rocker bishops in America, they joined him, they dissolved their dioceses, and they became members of uh, what later on became the OCA. So from 1935 until 1946, uh, rocker bishops were under North America Metropolitan as a result of this agreement that was achieved in Belgrade in 1935. How are we doing? Uh, is this is this uh, clear? Uh, 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 is, is... Uh, yes, it's clear. Um, yes. I would ask a little bit to speak a little bit about um, Patriarch Evlogi. A little bit, I don't know, just how to expand a little bit on his activity, if it's possible. No, let's let's let's. See. I, I would like to cover the whole lens. Let's see if we have okay. time because I don't think we are really doing that great time wise. So. Uh, in 1938, during this time, St. Vladimir Seminary was founded. So it, and it kind of, I think now it's not, uh, not clear if, I don't think if, if you come to uh, St. Vladimir's and start polling people and, and ask them, why is St. Vladimir's? I will be surprised if they would say back because in 1938, there was 950th anniversary of the baptism of Rus. And this was widespread event for all Russians abroad. And they decided to christen this newly founded place after St. Vladimir as part of this vision as St. Vladimir, Holy Prince Vladimir, uh, as a model for Russians. Right? That, 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 that's my understanding why it, it became St. Vladimir's and not, and, and not other name. So it's distinguishedly Russian, distinguishedly Russian, uh, how to say, uh, uh, lead, okay? And so uh, it's also, we cannot say that Russian Church abroad had anything to do with this foundation of St. Vladimir's, but it was done during the time when both churches were uh, in full communion and, and in full cooperation in America. So World War II, 
most of the uh, Russian church abroad uh, parishes uh, were uh, on the territories controlled by the Axis powers uh, and their allies, with the exception of churches in uh, America, uh, of course, Canada, England, Switzerland, and Australia. But all China, remember, was a huge position, right? Remember all those uh, two, 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 two. You see those five points, right? All those five, five points, major centers of the Russian diaspora, they were under Axis. Shanghai was controlled by Japanese. Okay, so was Harbin. Paris was in the occupied France. Belgrade was also. And of course, no mentioning Berlin. Okay, so people, uh, I mean, the headquarter, the headquarter in uh, uh, Belgrade was uh, very isolated. They could not really communicate. Churches in Switzerland uh, and England, they were under uh, Archbishop Vitaly Maximenko of Jersey City because they could communicate with the states, but they, they could not communicate with Belgrade. So was divisive, of course, of whether to, to what extent the Nazis invasion was supported. So Metropolitan Anastasi, he moderately supported it, carefully supported in a sense that because it was giving chance for the mission, it was giving chance for uh, uh, hope that Russian indep uh, independent uh, uh, in the, uh, the, 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 that independent Russia would be restored in, in, in the course of those events, and that was his hope. So with this in mind, he uh, uh, supported with reservations sort of the Soviet, in, uh, the Russian, uh, the Nazis invasion, but uh, he was very naturally carefully man, so it's all those things came across, and he was an Anglophile, spent spent over 10 years in the British controlled Palestine. So he kind of uh, he didn't say, I think too, too many things that he would regret later on, but still uh, he was uh, for the record, he, he was supportive in the view that it would liberate Russia from the communists, okay? But uh, right. So uh, at, the, at the end of the World War II, in 1946, uh, the Russian Church abroad consisted in Europe uh, of two bishops. Without having any internet connections, uh, without having any uh, any communications with people in Ch with bishops in China, right? With bishops in America, so. Uh, within a number of months, Metropolitan Anastasi was able to find his way to Geneva, and from there he started to uh, communicate with the uh, uh, rest of the Russian Church abroad. And now Russian Church abroad was suddenly uh, reinforced by influx of ref refugee bishops from the Soviet Union, like uh, all bishops from Belarusia, they left with Germans. I mean, I'm not sure if they were evacuated on the order of Germans or their own volition. One of them came back uh, to Belarus, but like the whole country le left without bishops. So they kind of did the same things as the rocker bishops did. Uh, I mean, the future rocker bishops did in 1920, because again, uh, and I think that hierarch who, who, find, who I think his name was John Lavrenenko, who came back, he was arrested. So kind of, uh, we talked about this in canon law that it was not something that bishops must do, right? They could leave. So Russian church abroad was reinforced. And by 1959, Russian church abroad was strong, uh, uh, spread all over the world with the headquarter where it is right now in the Upper East Side. 1950, Metropolitan Anastasi moved to the States. Uh, 10 years after St. Vladimir, as you see on this timeline, our seminary was founded. And it was founded already after the separation because in 1946, 
at the Pan American Council, at the seventh Pan American Council in Cleveland. So the North American Metropolia uh, proclaim uh, uh, independence from the Russian Church abroad, right? Basically, they see it as a like equal relationship. And 1946, they ceased uh, commemoration of Metropolitan Anastasi. And otherwise, we might just have St. Vladimir's. If we would be one, what would be reason? Because St. Tikhon Seminary was also founded around the same time when Jordanville was founded. I mean, so why would we have three seminaries, right? It's, but because Russian Church abroad restored its diocese in the States, also they had their own seminary in Jordanville, right? Because sort of ecclesiastical relations were at the low point at this point. So they wouldn't send people to study at St. Vladimir's. Okay, so we move farther going here. So Metropolitan Anastasi passed away in 1965. There was a division between bishops uh, along the uh, predictable lines, sort of uh, conventionally called a group of diplomats, conventionally called a group of zealots. So, and uh, Metropolitan, uh, future, the future Metropolitan Philaret was uh, recently consecrated bishop. So he was uh, selected as, a, as a, a compromise person because he didn't belong to either party, but sort of naturally by his views, he was a zealot. And so, uh, and uh, we are also seeing a change of Russian church abroad uh, approach because under Metropolitan Anastasi, he strongly uh, believed that Russian church abroad also had uh, uh, had uh, temporary status as a refugee church, and in this position, the Russian Church should not do anything, anything sort of uh, above, uh, above her pay level, kind of. Like uh, uh, he was against canonization of Saint John of Kronstadt, not because Saint John of Kronstadt was not uh, a, a, a suitable candidate, but because kind of. It would belong to the entire Russian church. But with Metropolitan Philaret's time, this uh, kind of sensitivity, this attitude uh, didn't really matter much because sort of uh, he didn't see a problem why, why we wouldn't canonize uh, St. John of Cronstadt, Cronstadt. And he was canonized the same year when he became Metropolitan. Then also uh, Russian church abroad started to receive clergy uh, who would come from other jurisdictions because they were scandalized by uh, the things they saw there with their bishops. Some of the things were quite unprecedented, like uh, uh, lifting of anathemas by Patriarch of in 1965. So, uh, and uh, those people would uh, praise Russian church abroad as the only custodian of the faith as a, as a pillar of the faith and so on that kind of contributed to, to particular self-perception also in the Russian church abroad. In 1971, the traditional practice of the Russian church was changed in the diaspora by Russian church abroad. So now all Westerners expected to be received through baptism instead of chrismation to the Russian church abroad. Uh, responding to the aftercephaly given by the Moscow Patriarchate in 1971, Russian Church abroad proclaimed that Catacomb Church, but not the Moscow Patriarchate, was the mother church for the Russian Church abroad. So, okay, and in 1982, uh, Bishop Lazarus was consecrated secretly in Moscow. Uh, in ne next year, there was uh, anathema against ecumenism, but it's important to understand that ecumenism was understood there uh, as branch theory, because it's, it's how it's spelled out. So it's like if you if someone believes that the whole Church of Christ consists from all Christian denominations. So then, then, then it's it's anathema. Okay, so basically, sort of seeing all, all of them as equal equal branches of the of the same uh, Christian church. Right. So, 1988, Metropolitan Vitali. So, uh, how should uh, Russian Church abroad 
uh, deal with the situation. And Russian YouTube wrote declined to send observers to the council. I mean, there were unofficial observers at the uh, uh, millennium uh, celebrations in 1988. Okay, but in 1990, Russian Church abroad decided to receive uh, faithful uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. So had uh, its own parishes for, for like 16 years. And Metropolitan Vitali, uh, he uh, stepped down in 2001, then he changed his mind, but bishops elected Metropolitan Lorus. Okay, and Metropolitan Lorus was the one who started to have uh, conversations with the Church of Russia, which resulted in our union. Okay, so what do we, uh, uh, what did we get out of this? So our bishops can participate in Bishop Council. Uh, so I'm going to be God willing uh, on Thursday uh, taking part in the Canon Law Committee of the Intercouncilor Presence. Right, uh, I supposed to be there last night uh, with Metropolitan Larion of Moscow in other commission, but it didn't work out. So basically, I think we can export a lot of good things here back home. Just the whole idea of having intercouncilor presence is inspiring. Like sort of, we have very many uh, devout people who could uh, be very helpful to the church if we, if we would identify them, if we would try to foster conversation maybe, to talk, to, to find more from people, basically. So I think uh, it, it challenges our perceptions that there is nothing learned from Russia because Russia is very different uh, in the social uh, sort of circumstances very different in Russia than in diaspora. I think sort of when you keep your eyes open, you can always learn from anywhere. Okay, so thank you very much uh, uh, for, uh, for your uh, time. Now, uh, I, I'm going to